Welcome everyone to our 2021 Directors Lecture Series hosted by William Ned Friedman. Dr. Friedman is the eighth director of the Arnold Arboretum in its nearly 150 year history, as well as Arnold Professor of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology with Harvard University. As a botanist, he has devoted his career to studying the evolution of plants, in particular, the origin of flowering plants, also known as Darwin's abominable mystery. As director of the Arnold Arboretum, Ned is responsible for stewarding, promoting, and sharing the extraordinary botanical and horticultural resources of the Arnold Arboretum with students, scholars, and many thousands of visitors. Thank you, Ned, and welcome, and let's get going with this. All right, thank you, Pam. Um, it's just wonderful to be here this evening. I'm so pleased to be able to introduce Professor Taya Miles, a colleague of mine at Harvard University, whom I've gotten to know over the last year. Taya Miles is Professor of History and Radcliffe Alumni uh, Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. She is a public historian, academic historian, and creative writer whose work explores the intersections of African-American, Native American, and women's histories. Taya offers courses on African-American women, Native American women, abolitionist women, and Black Indian histories and identities. She's become increasingly engaged in environmental humanities questions and ways of articulating and enlivening African-American environmental consciousness. She is the author of five books. And if I was both to read the titles and all of the awards that, we, that she received for these books, we wouldn't have time for her to give a talk. But I'll give you an example of one, uh, The Dawn of Detroit, A Chronicle of Slavery and Freedom in the City of the Straits, uh, 2017. It received the Merle Curdy Award in Social History and James A. Raleigh Prize in the History of Race Relations from the Organization of American Historians the James Bradford Best Biography Prize from the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award in Nonfiction, an American Book Award, and a Frederick Douglass Prize. You'll have to look up all the, the work and prizes and, and recognition for the other four books so I can move on to the next thing. Um, her prize-winning scholarly articles and essays explore 19th century women's struggles against injustice, conjoined Black and Native histories and literatures, public histories of plantations and Southern coastal environments. She is a recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship Award. And from her background before she came to Harvard, she received an AB in Afro-American studies from Harvard uh, University, a master's degree in women's studies from Emory University and a PhD in American studies from the University of Minnesota. Before coming to Harvard, Taya taught on the faculty of the University of Michigan for 16 years, where she served as chair of the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, director of the Native American Studies Program, and founding director of Eco Girls, an environmental and cultural opportunities for girls uh, group that uh, I, I actually would like to learn much more about at another time, Taya. Um, the one thing that has been really remarkable uh, as I've gotten to know Taya in the last year is that she has, we began to interact over a story of a pecan that we, you will hear more about this evening. And she has been incredibly gracious uh, to share her insights into the intertwined histories of this tree and enslaved people. And uh, I have enjoyed, as we described, as Taya was saying just a few minutes ago, that we almost be, in a sense became pen pals uh, last summer as we went back and forth to explore uh, some fascinating uh, and also you know, deeply troubling aspects of American history. So uh, without further ado, um, every pecan tree, trees, meaning, and memory in enslaved people's lives. Haya? Thank you so much, Ned. And thank you, Pam. I have to add to that introduction uh, something that Ned didn't tell you, and that is during uh, some of the most shocking times of the pandemic, when we were all trying to understand what on earth was taking place and how we would contend with it, Ned planted pecan seeds and he actually brought a little seedling in a pot to my house and he put it down on my front steps. And that for me was such an important moment of the possibility of growth and light at the end of the tunnel. I am now 
going to share my screen and talk about trees. Thank you all for being here this evening. We're assembling around our pandemic era campfire, the blue lit screen, just one more time. I'm joining you from my home in Cambridge, which is the ancestral homelands and territory of the Massachusetts people. Massachusetts families lived, learned, and labored here with the land and its non-human residents. A Massachusetts woman leader signed the first contract granting use of some of these lands for the purpose of building Harvard College. Today, the Massachusetts people remain in Massachusetts, in New England, and in diaspora. And they, along with their indigenous neighbors, such as the Wampanoags, Nipmucks, and Narragansetts, will always be the keepers of this land. Despite the story I just told you about the seedling turning up on my doorstep, I would not have expected to be speaking in an Arboretum series about pecan trees. I'm not a botanist or an ecologist or a forester or a nature poet, but I am someone who feels gratitude toward trees and I have since I was a girl. One of my favorite places as a grade schooler was a branchy nest down the alley from my father's house which was a small and sturdy Sears kit kind of structure in a black neighborhood that he had inherited from his own father. At the juncture where our alley met my babysitter's paved street, a large honeysuckle bush thrived in all its wildness. This was my favorite place to read and think. It was a secret protective shelter unknown even to my younger siblings. Occasionally, when I became hungry while daydreaming beneath the canopy of the bush, I plucked and chewed on the sweet white and yellow petals. It will not surprise you to learn that this honeysuckle bush is gone now, as are all of the trees and grassy patches that once backed this rear border of our inner city neighborhood. Over the decades, the area was squeezed in a vice grip of development. The nationally award-winning Cincinnati Zoo expanded on one side, while a multitude of hospital buildings appeared on the other side, until all that was left of our once cozy neighborhood was a few short naked streets surrounded by parking lots. At a recent retreat on Black ecofeminism held at the University of Michigan, an Afro-Native professional storyteller, Elizabeth James, commented that, quote, Women of color are synonymous with the land. We are responsible for making sure that people live somewhere and get fed. We are responsible for navigating the land to care for others, for nourishment of our communities. But we have a history of being displaced from Africa through native land dispossession, through slave sales and gentrification. Recognizing that, as she put it, the land is its own entity, Beth James asked the group, how do we care for the land under these circumstances? And how do we care for the people? James's comments and many more made at that retreat underscored a dual loss. An erosion of the land linked to a deterioration of the community's well-being. And yet, amid these mounting losses, trees among the oldest inhabitants of the land have been human companions helping to anchor identities, mark memories, and reorient us to ethical duties. It is perhaps this feeling of personal and communal loss tied to longing and the sense of our desperate need for reorientation that has landed me here in an Arboretum series about the country. In my settings of Black and Indigenous enslavement in what is now the United States, as well as Native American enslavement of Black people, I started paying attention to the trees. The material that I'm going to share with you this evening is a bundling of five tree stories that I have come across in the narratives, documentary interpretations, and material culture of enslaved people and their descendants. And once we take note of these trees, I will ask that we step back and try to perceive the forest as a whole. That is, 
the meaning of these various tree stories and the experiences of enslaved people and the meaning of enslaved people's lives with trees and a wider natural landscape to our present moment and predicament. The stories that I have assembled for this talk demonstrate, I would suggest, the importance of trees and other features of the living earth as protectors of bodies and spirits, as sites of violence, as memory keepers, and as historical witnesses in the Black experience of captivity and resistance. Ultimately, I suggest that reflection on examples like these will underscore the centrality of the natural world to Black enslaved people's perseverance, and indeed, to human survival, our survival. My presentation is divided into two parts. One, the trees, and two, the forest, which will serve as a conclusion. Part one, the trees. 15 years ago, in the months before Hurricane Katrina struck and exposed the vulnerability of so many poor and black people's lives to extreme weather here in the US, I heard a presentation, much more like a Jeremiah, that transformed my thinking. Dorcita Taylor, a leading black sociologist and environmental studies scholar, sit before the faculty of our African-American studies program on the occasion of its anniversary and told those assembled that black studies needed to focus our attention on environment and climate change before it was too late. To illustrate her point, she offered that Harriet Tubman was an environmentalist who had to know the trees and mosses to navigate the fierce terrain of Southern slavery. Taylor's words stuck with me. And since then, I've been thinking not only about environmental urgencies, but also about trees as witnesses to African-American history in the face of scarce records and a general unwillingness to recall black suffering in our nation. In the seminar that I'm currently teaching, the students and I spent two weeks discussing Harriet Tubman called Araminta or Minty Ross as a child. And we joked about how these weeks happened to fall within February, every institution's favorite month for highlighting Tubman as a famed Underground Railroad conductor and Civil War nurse and spy. Tubman, whose image will now grace the $20 bill, is in many ways the Black woman that all Americans know but do not understand. In class, we teased out what we could glean about Tubman's thoughts and actions with regard to her environment. As a young woman enslaved on the Eastern shore of Maryland, who had been seriously injured by an overseer, leaving her with a lifelong disability, Tubman bargained with her owner to hire out her time. She went to work in the woods, collecting timber with a crew of men and sought to save the small portion of her pay that she was allowed to keep to purchase her freedom. This was grueling hard labor, but Tubman became skilled at it. As one Tubman biographer, Kate Clifford Larson points out in her book, Bound for the Promised Land, Tubman learned how to listen and how to forage and how to navigate in the woods. She later applied her knowledge to the several escapes she carried out through the trees and across the waterways of the Eastern shore, ultimately rescuing, rescuing approximately 70 people. In our class, we read an article in Audubon Magazine about Tubman's use of owl calls to communicate with fugitives and heard a guest presentation by American Studies scholar, Perry Meldon, who was researching the role of the muskrat in Tubman's environment. Because as a child, Tubman was forced to stand in the brackish water and catch these creatures for her owners. There are few primary sources that allow us to access Tubman's thoughts and words directly. Among the materials we do have is a biography of Tubman that she dictated to a white abolitionist sympathizer. Still in this biography, bits of Tubman's experience shine through. For instance, Tubman recalls, quote, in the Eastern shore of Maryland, Dorchester County is where I was born. The first thing I remember was lying in the cradle. You see in these trees that are hollow, take a big tree, cut it down, put a boat in each end, make a cradle of it and call it a gum. I remember lying in that there, end quote. 
And Larson, who is an attentive biographer of Tubman, points out in her book that the seed pods of the sweet gum tree that was common to Tubman's surroundings turned sharp and dangerously prickly, causing damage to the feet of Tubman and those she aided in escape, who often lacked shoes. Tubman's memory of the sweet gum cradle offers a glimpse of love and loss. While she was being embraced by the body of a felled tree, she was separated from her own mother's body, the mother who was forced to work in other rooms of the big house, while white ladies, as Tubman calls them, tossed Tubman in the air like a doll. The sweet gum tree elicited a childhood memory of pleasure and of pain for Harriet Tubman, even as the trees that likely served as landmarks on her treacherous roots north also laced that path with thorns. John Brown escaped slavery in Georgia after a series of dramatic attempts and eventually relocated to London. His narrative of his life and sufferings and escape details torturous punishments and medical experimentations that Brown underwent at the hands of enslavers, which are shocking even to our overexposed modern sensibilities. Brown opens his narrative with an account of his ownership and of his parents. He recalled that his father was African, Ibo. They had only seen the man once. When his father was moved by the father's owner, John Brown's mother was, quote, forced to take another husband. Brown described living with his mother, with his stepfather and other siblings, and sleeping on boards on the floor of the slave cabin. Almost immediately in the second paragraph of his narrative, John Brown recounts a painful memory centered around a tree. It was not the memory of a racially motivated hanging or lynching, the atrocious and extra legal punishments in which innocent trees were forced to participate without their consent. It was instead the memory of a sadistic childhood game. John Brown told of how his owner, Betty Moore, a 70-year-old woman, would quote, call us children up to the big house every morning and give us a dose of garlic and rue to, and here he quotes his mistress, make us grow likely for market. This woman then forced the children to exercise, making them, quote, run round a great sycamore tree in the yard. And if we did not run fast enough to please her, she used to make us nimbler by laying about us with a cowhide. Here, a striking landmark on the plantation was used as a method of control for children, who through this exercise, concocted by their mistress, would learn not only that their worth was a market value, but also that their parents lacked the power to protect them from abuse. We do not know whether John Brown and his family had alternative and oppositional relationships with the great sycamore tree. We do learn further into his narrative that Brown uses trees to aid his whites. He embarks on an incredible escape attempt by traveling by night and concealing himself, quote, behind a log or in a tree. Alongside the Tennessee River, he hid in the woods and constructed a raft from float wood that he painstakingly collected on the water's surface. He traveled for nine nights this way, hiding his raft in bushes by day until he had finally made it to the Ohio River. This attempt ultimately ended in his recapture and sail farther south. But Brown tried again, this time starting off from Louisiana, applying his method of traveling by night and, quote, sleeping behind logs like a wild man, unquote. He survived by eating raw corn, potatoes, pine roots, and sassafras buds, and eventually made it to the free state of Illinois. For Brown, like Tubman, hollow trees would carry memories, even as trees could be mechanisms of pain in slavery's landscape. Harriet Jacobs, whose narrative, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, is the most elaborate account published by an enslaved woman of the U.S. South, fills her memoir of slavery with nature's presences. Following the death of her mother, when Harriet Jacobs was just six, she learned, quote, by talk around me, that I was a slave. Jacobs' memories after this event are characterized by sexual threat and grave fear. 
by the mixed emotions of an enslaved mother who wishes her children to live, but also to die to escape slavery. And the fight to free herself and children from the mastery of others. As the black feminist geographer, Catherine McKittrick has noted, Jacobs leverages her environment during the constant state of war that was slavery. We might even call her a nature writer as Jacobs speaks frequently about her environmental surround and movingly through metaphors of nature. She marks the presence, literally and figuratively, of natural elements, water, wind, sunshine, starlight, woods, dirt, vines, fruit, and the atmosphere. Rivers and swamps are escape routes and hiding places. Woods and trees offer shade, places of rest, spaces of sacred ritual, and a shield against the scrutiny of enslavers. Jacob strikes of black women, quote, hiding themselves in woods and swamps, end quote, to evade slave patrols. And she writes of the religious faithful attending, quote, their little church in the woods with their burying ground around it. Jacobs herself took cover in the snaky swamp during her final escape. There, the captain of the secret boat commented, referring to the swamp, is a slave territory that defies all laws. Indeed, a defiance of man-made slave law must be what instilled the natural world with preternatural value to those crushed beneath the weight of such legislation. Nature abided by the laws of physics, or devout women like Harriet Jacobs might say, by the laws of God, occupying a sphere above and beyond the brute lash of slavery systems. Nature could, of course, apply its own blunt forces, but in doing so, it threatened the mighty in society as well as the weak. When Jacobs reaches free land in Philadelphia with a fellow runaway, she turns to natural light as a symbol of freedom, writing, I called Fanny to see the sunrise for the first time in our lives on free soil. We watched the red mean sky and saw the great orb come up slowly out of the water as it seemed. Soon the waves began to sparkle and everything caught the beautiful glow. Sunlight floods Jacob's memory in this instance, but in the life of an unfree person, darkness often smothered the light. Jacob's does not hide the shadowed reality. Her complex narrative reveals the backhand of nature, which in her time as in ours could smart when it made contact. The sun will cloud over. The shade tree is also a whipping post. The river that carries a refugee from slavery also bears a body down into its depths. While hiding in her grandmother's shed prior to her permanent, permanent escape, Jacobs witnessed a suicide. She writes, quote, I saw a woman rush wildly by, pursued by two men. She was a slave, the wet nurse of the mistress's children. For some trifling offense, her mistress had ordered her to be stripped and whipped. To escape the degradation and the torture, she rushed to the river, jumped in, and ended her wrongs in death. Nature, we learned from Jacob's account, was an omnipresent element, an ally, and a deadly force. For millennia on a Native American clock, and for generations on an African American clock, wild big countries were nuts that very greatly in size, shell, thickness, flavor, and time to ripening. But Southern slaveholders and agriculturalists who had been experimenting with innovation since the mid 1700s wanted a big country that could be counted on for consistency. By the early 1800s, some were trying to create an engineered pecan through grafting which would merge shoots from the limbs of pecan trees, producing ideal nuts with stalks of select existing trees. The aim was for these hybrid trees to reliably produce the desired quality of nut. The first experimenter credited with noteworthy results was Abner Landrum, a South Carolina plantation owner already well known for creating a method for glazing stoneware pottery without the use of lead. In the 1820s, 
Landrum made at least two attempts to graft pecans on his Edgefield plantation. He described his first unsuccessful trial as having been, quote, made rather late in the season. He did better on the next try, reporting that, quote, I have this summer budded some dozens of pecan on the common hickory nut without a single failure as yet. And some of them are growing finely, unquote. Nevertheless, it was not Landrum, but, uh, but excuse me, an enslaved man named Antoine who crafted the first successful and widely reproduced pecan grafts. In the 1840s, a Louisiana doctor tried to graft a pecan tree on the Anita plantation. When the merger did not take, he sent cuttings to his neighbor across the Mississippi River, the owner of the now iconic Oak Alley plantation. Antoine, who was enslaved at Oak Alley, possessed considerable botanical skills, indicated by the fact that he was labeled, quote, gardener, enlisted with a high valuation of $1,000 in his owner's records, which would be approximately $30,000 today. Antoine's owner assigned him the job of grafting the cuttings. And in the winter of 1846, Antoine successfully hand grafted 16 trees that he nurtured into a healthy orchard of 110 trees. After Antoine's trees reached maturity in the years following the Civil War, they were producing plentiful nuts that sold for $50 to $75 per barrel. Still, new owners of the plantation had their enslaved laborers clear many of Antoine's trees to plant the more lucrative sugar, sugar cane. In 1876, the owner of Oak Alley exhibited nuts from Antoine's remaining trees at, at the Centennial Exposition, the World's Fair held in Philadelphia. The nuts received a commendation from a Yale botanist who praised them for their, quote, remarkably large size, tenderness of shell, and very special excellence. This pecan was called the Centennial and became the first pecan variety used in a commercial orchard, making Oak Alley, quote, the birthplace of commercial pecan production. Antoine, who is but a shadow in the historical record, received no glory or pay for his botanical feat. The pecan tree escaped widespread commercialization until the late 1800s and early 1900s. Much longer, says environmental historian James McWilliams, than any other native edible plant. The pecan, Williams writes, continue to stand tall on its own terms. And we should add, so did Antoine. And now for our final tree story. When the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture opened in autumn of 2016, it exhibited a unique object called Ashley Sack. Passed down through four generations of one family and then lost in the mid 20th century, the sack attributed to a girl named Ashley from South Carolina reemerged just over a decade ago at a Southern flea market. This plain cotton bag manufactured in the 1840s or 50s for agricultural purposes had been put to many uses over the decades. According to an inscription sewn directly onto the sack, the object once belonged to an enslaved woman named Rose who gave it to her child, Ashley, packed full of necessary items. The sack was a desperate gift of love bestowed upon an enslaved daughter by an enslaved mother at the time of their separation through sale in antebellum South Carolina. Embroidered with the narrative of this dramatic event by a descendant who inherited the item, a domestic worker in Philadelphia named Ruth Middleton. The bag now functions as a remarkable textile record of slavery and moving story of family survival made possible by material items and love. The sentences on the bag read, my great grandmother Rose, mother of Ashley gave her this sack when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina. It held a tattered dress, 
three handfuls of pecans, a braid of Rose's hair, told her, it be filled with my love always. She never saw her again. Ashley is my grandmother, Ruth Middleton, 1921. This bag had taken a winding path to reach the nation's capital and is, as we speak tonight, en route back down south again. The bag belongs to Middleton Place Foundation, the private nonprofit owner of Middleton Place Plantation, an 18th century rice estate outside of Charleston. And here, what you're looking at is actually just a flanker of the original Middleton a place plantation. It's just one of the buildings that survived. The main house would have been in the middle with a building equal to the one you see on the other side. A donor discovered the sack at a Tennessee flea market in 2007 and purchased it for a small sum. After doing some internet research and uncovering the name Middleton, she contacted staff at Middleton Place and donated the bag. Middleton Place curators named the item Ashley Sack and displayed it on their premises, as well as at an exhibition in New York City. During a Southern tour in search of objects, Wilsonian curators encountered the clock and acquired it on loan from Middleton Place. The sack was much in the news at the time of the museum's opening, rising to national attention, chiefly through the research and writing of anthropologist and museum administrator, Mark Auslander. This cotton seed or flower sack is an example of what material culture historians Earl Thatcher Ulrich and Ivan Gaskell have called, quote, dazzling things that sometimes show up in ordinary places. In packing this sack, a carrier of kinship and feeling, a woman named Rose gathered materials to cushion a tragedy in her child's life. Rose made a survival kit out of a utilitarian thing and common objects at her disposal. A dress, pecans, and a braid of her own hair. This sack that surely functioned as a lifeline for Ashley allows us to glimpse the actions and emotions of enslaved women who lived in relationship with trees. As we tell our most precious stories, we recall the wear of unfolding lives. The Afro-Native environmental writer and geologist Lorette Savoy captured this sense in a comment she offered during the Black Ecofeminism Retreat that I began this talk with. Lives take place, Savoy said. And so Ashley would have remembered the quality of the light the day she was torn away from her mother. She would have recalled the lay of the land that she passed over when taken felt to get in her bones through bodily memory, the bump and pitch of those poor rural roads carrying her away from kin. It is possible that Ashley relied on features of the environment to remember, to hold firmly in mind, that even as her heart felt like it was dying, the pulsing physical world around her still lived. What were the physical features of that world? Where were the outdoor rooms that Ashley might have turned to for comfort? Well, Ashley was, first of all, a coastal river baby. We intuit this from her name. Ashley's name was rare for an enslaved South Carolinian and for women in the period in general. We can surmise that the Ashley River, which formed one side of Charleston's boundary, inspired this unusual name. Nevertheless, Ashley spent most of her childhood in the South Carolina interior, more than 100 miles away from that river's flow. These have been the homelands of Creek Indians, whose grounds spanned Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama prior to the federal policy of Indian removal that forced their expulsion. Short stem cotton became the lucrative staple crop produced by the hands of the laboring unfree in this place. The Savannah and Adisto rivers together with a net of streams and swamps cut through the flat pine and poplar forested land. A traveler passing through in 1843 described with melancholy, quote, 
the forest of gigantic long-leaved pine that possessed a beauty and even sublimity which is rarely surpassed. But we're being exposed to useless and unprofitable destruction." End quote. Many of these pine trees would be felled by the edge of the blade and by the bulk of enslaved people's muscle as cotton plantations spread westward. Summers sweltered with heat and humidity. Forest animals abounded here, from bears, wolves, and mountain lions in the 1700s to smaller woodland and riverine creatures, raccoons, rabbits, opossums, eels, and snakes in Ashley's time. As Carolina enslavers shifted into this region from the coastline, they started anew with land clearance and town building projects, establishing plantations, mills, and eventually a railroad that would transport cotton back to Charleston. These Midlands, a swath of inland cotton plantations, was to be the place where Ashley matured and later had her own children. Her descendants lived in this inner region of a rural cotton belt, South Carolina, until the Great Migration carried Ruth Middleton, the descendant who'd inscribed the sack, north to Philadelphia. But before all of this happened, Ashley would have to discover herself. She would have to find anchors in nature. And she would do so, we can imagine, with her mother's gift of nuts that she could have used as food or as seed. These nuts, the pecan, were among the richest raw foods that Rose could have gotten her hands on. Indigenous to the American Southern climes, pecans are high in nutritional value, brimming with, quote, protein, fiber, healthy fats, nutrients, vitamins, and antioxidants. They are also plentiful on the land, ranging over a broad natural habitat in the central, southern, and midwestern U.S. states, Louisiana, Alabama, Texas, Illinois and in Northern Mexico, where they naturally cluster around the Mississippi and Guadalupe rivers and tributaries. Although wild pecans did not originate in the Southeast, the trees are prevalent now in the region where Ashley and Rose lived. The word pecan derives from a native language as indigenous people use the term pecan or hard shelled nut. French settlers learned the word from Natchez people in Mississippi in the, 1700, in the 1700s and spelled it P-A-C-A-N-E-S. Pecan nuts are easily gathered in productive seasons. And as the environmental historian Lenny Wells has noted, they're like energy capsules, providing quote, 19 vitamins and minerals and an astounding 690 kilocalories per 100 gram of nut meat. End quote. Pecans also store well and can keep for six to 12 months in cool, dry places. They are, as the Potawatomi botanist and environmental writer Robin Wall Kimmerer has stated, good winter food with everything needed to sustain life. End quote. The same benefits that made the pecan a treasured food among Native peoples made this nut important to enslaved African Americans, a population in desperate need of food that was plentiful, reachable, free, portable, nutritious, and filling. How does Ashley's story end? Not, we know, with maternal reunion, for she never saw her prescient mother, the pecan gifter Rose, again. And yet her family's story supports the prescription of visionary writer Alice Walker, who wrote, quote, Perhaps our planet is for learning to appreciate the extraordinary wonder of life that surrounds even our suffering and to say yes, if through the thickest of tears. Part two, the forest, and this part is much shorter. For each enslaved person, the story we have considered, trees were a necessity of freedom seeking and survival. And in our time, trees are often the only remaining physical markers of the lives, loves, and freedom struggles of enslaved people. Harriet Tubman's first memories were of being cradled 
and the arms of a tree. In Harriet Jacobs' community, trees created spaces of secrecy and solace. Although we cannot intuit Antoine's relationship with his pecan trees, we know that he fathered a grove. Among the most precious items that Rose packed for her daughter Ashley were the pecan nuts that will go down in history as lifesavers. When asked about the meaning of place in an oral history, Mary Yelling, a descendant of enslaved people in Alabama, said that she remembered, quote, every pecan tree, end quote. Memory for Yelling was naturalized, lit and shadowed by natural companions in a way that Toni Morrison once brilliantly described in her oft-quoted essay, Sites of Memory. Enslaved people and their descendants lived with trees and recollected those lives with the aid of trees, shaping a defense of dignity and spirit that enlisted environmental materials. Surely these memories, like bright leaves pressed down into autumn soils, co-create fertile ground for self-knowledge and group resilience. The environmental history of slavery is a vast category, inclusive not only of human-made things that enslaved people fashioned, handled, and used, but also of unfettered wild things that enslaved people observed, considered, and related with. Trees, rivers, swamps, plants, skies, and symbolic items like cowrie shells and conjure roots must all be taken into account. Of these, the North Star of the Night Sky plays the most legendary part in the collective memories of enslaved people. Harriet Tubman said that she traveled, quote, with only the North Star as her guide. And John Brown, the man from Georgia whose account we touched on earlier, was known as, quote, another of the travelers bound to the North Star. While stars are a physical reality and symbolic trope worthy of deep consideration, I have suggested here that so too are trees. So what are we to make of these cases and stories? What can they tell us about the lives of enslaved people in the past? And what do they mean to our present and future as we grapple with the contradictions of lives lived with and in a weakened natural world? First, attending to trees in our thinking about enslaved people, his, people's history shows that they were, of course, environmentally aware and interdependent. Their routes to life, resistance, freedom, well-being, and self-reflection traveled through wooded terrain. The journalist, ta Coates, captured this sense of rich life in the woods amid the theft of humanity that characterized slavery when he wrote in his memoir, Between the World and Me, that slavery is, quote, a particular specific enslaved woman whose mind is active as your own, whose range of feeling is as vast as your own who prefers the way the light falls in one particular spot in the woods." End quote. Viewing trees as living historical sources enables us to approach a deeper understanding of enslaved people's multidimensional experience and perhaps of our own. And second, we see that nature labor was a skilled endeavor for enslaved people from which they not only enriched enslavers, this part is true, but they also enabled their own and their communities advancement. Oftentimes, when we think of the antebellum South, cotton fields and drudge laborers come to mind unbidden. Agricultural work, especially carried out through the forced method of gang labor, has been cast as brutal, degendering, and anonymizing. And it was. Typically, when scholars of slavery describe the special category of skilled laborers, they note male craftsmen of many kinds and female dressmakers. We must add to that list woodswomen who felled trees like Tubman and botanists who grew and grafted plants like Antoine. And once we see that work in nature requires a genius all its own, we can go back to the records of slavery and ask who else we might find and in which places and in which stories to bear witness to their lives and their struggles. Enslaved people held a critical awareness of their environments. 
that consciousness was not just practical, but also cultural, seeping into the seedbed of African-American collective memory. Beyond revealing a clearer view of Black eco-cultural lenses, sitting with these stories of slavery may offer political lessons for our own time. We exist in the condition of having degraded most of the planet. Enslaved people encountered and intimately interacted with a similarly ravaged plantation landscape as victims and participants. They inflicted damage as the exploited labor force that was compelled to clear woods, weed rice, pick cotton, and harvest tobacco on depleted, eroding soils. And yet they found in those same stretches of tender acreage, a rare earth element, hope. Black bodies, backs bent, broke the land, and then turned again to that very land for what the 19th century Black feminist poet, Francis W. Harper, described as a, quote, hope of deliverance, represented in her work by a frozen river surrounded by trees. Enslaved African Americans were a ransacked people, surviving on a ransacked earth. Their stories may enable us to sift out ways to live with grace on this traumatized black and blue planet. Thank you. Taya, thank you so much for a beautiful, beautiful presentation. Uh, there's so much to, to take in and to think about. And you've all now revealed to me some additional stories that I have to ponder. I want to uh, come back to uh, perception and what you have shared with us this evening about environmental sensitivity and this I. This, this very clear from the, the passages you, you, you uh, quoted, this very clear sense of, 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 of the potential for tight awareness of the natural world and, uh, and, and how it, what, I guess when I, my question is, was this something, is this something that is uh, generally known or is this something that again, history requires a greater interrogation uh, to reveal these sensitivities? Thank you for your comments on what I shared, Ned. I appreciate that. I think the answer to your question really depends on where we sit mm -hmm. and where we sit when trying to assess the answer. Um, at the start of this event, you mentioned that I founded an organization for girls in Michigan that was an environmental education organization. I have to say that when I was getting going with starting that, I talked with somebody who was, um, who was leading a major environmental unit, shall we say, at a university. And that person expressed um, this belief, skepticism, that black people would show up for environmental activities. I think and I hope that we have moved past that point by now, especially in our current moment. But it really has been the case that African Americans have been viewed as being somehow stuck in time and attached to a rural Southern nature, but being outside of uh, present environmental concerns and consciousness and awareness. That, of course, would not be the view of African Americans who, who live their lives, our lives, in a natural world. You know, of course. You know, I have done a little bit of writing about this topic in, in public venues, and many of the responses that I've received from readers were uh, from Black people who were saying, Yeah, you know, I live in a rural area in the South, and I, you know, I fish all the time. I used to go hunting with my family. These, these stories are very familiar to me. So the notion that there is not a deep connection between African-Americans and nature is one that I think um, has resulted from a problem of asking the wrong people 
and I, I think it's also one that's resulted from an association in uh, the broader public understanding of Black people only with urban spaces. And furthermore, an understanding or definition of urban spaces as not being natural spaces, you know, which of course they are. Every place is a natural space and, and, and every natural space has also been touched by, uh, by, by human life. So going back though, in terms of scholars uh, to uh, the era of enslavement, um, I, I guess more broadly, um, how much have, ha has been interrogated about the very specifics? I mean, you gave us five examples. Uh, are, how much is there of a record? Since you, I, I think of Antoine and I think about the, the very slender uh, string that allows anyone today to know of his existence. I think then of, of what you uh, described with John Brown and with Harriet Tubman and, and Harriet Jacobs, where we have their words, we have the ability to go back. But the question, so my, I'm curious, how much of this has been studied and how much can we gain additional insight into the subtleties of the, the lived lives that uh, you've given us a, a, a window into about what it meant to many different people in many different parts of the uh, South and, and or North, wherever, when it came to the African-American experience and nature, uh, but particularly when the written records might be sparse. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll start with the end of your question, the written records problem. Yes, there, there's too little evidence. We don't have enough. <clears throat> we desperately wish that we had more. And so this is part of the reason why I made the point in what I shared that we can open up the archive of, of where we look for enslaved people's histories and experiences. We can look to features of the landscape, elements of the natural world to give us hints and clues. And of course, these spaces, these places, these elements would have changed over time. But oftentimes, as in the case of trees, they're a lot older than we are, right? Um, they're a lot older than uh, many of our American paper records. And while I am not someone who is qualified to study the trees themselves or the plants themselves to understand what they might be telling within their own bodies, I do think that these existing living things can serve as reminders for us, serve as markers for us, serve as breadcrumbs for us as we try to piece together the history. I mean, to me, having the image of uh, what's been called Mother Centennial, the first tree that Antoine grafted that I showed, which is, which is actually um, no longer standing, sad to say, um, but having that image is incredible because we can imagine touching a tree that Antoine planted. We don't have his thoughts written down, but we do have a record of what he did. Now, on the question of how attentive has slavery studies been to the issue of environment and to nature, I would say not very over time. But you know, this is a field with a lot to do, right? I mean, for so many years, enslaved people were not considered people at all. And in the history of the US South, of, uh, of the United States more generally, African-Americans were marginalized, not considered central. So slavery studies has quite a lot of work to do just to recover. We are still oftentimes in recovery mode, trying to figure out who was there, what happened to them, what were their experiences. And yet this area of inquiry is really growing and it's growing in exciting ways right now. Uh, one of our colleagues in, uh, here at Harvard, Walter Johnson has done a lot of thinking on this. Uh, he's written a book about capitalism in the Westward area that actually John Brown was sold into the Louisiana Mississippi River area. And he does wonderful thinking in that book around environment and around the ways in which plantations became carceral landscapes. And the landscape piece of that is very important. He makes a point um, in his recent book that 
well, not the newest book, but the one before that, River of Dark Dreams, that as plantations were put into place and as the forested lands were cleared, enslaved people had fewer areas to run to. They had fewer areas to hide in. And so the expansion of a plantation and capitalist system, which was awful for the land, also closed in enslaved people and dispossessed Native American people. It was really a, a triple violence. So we're, we're getting um, more thinking on this, we're getting deeper thinking on this. There's an area of thinking that's lately been labeled Black ecologies. That term goes back to uh, an older article um, written by Nathan Hare, but it's been uh, revitalized in really recent months and years by a number of younger scholars, including uh, J.T. Rohn, who's done a quite, quite a lot of thinking about um, this notion of the plot and plotting, which is actually really wonderful. You could probably already get a sense of what he's thinking about when I say that, you know, the plot is a plot of land, the plot as you know, a scheme for resistance and so on. Uh, I mean, it, it will be so interesting to see as, as more of this uh, is, is daylighted. I think it's a, it's a remarkable uh, sense of a relationship. I mean, I just, I'm thinking about going to the Arboretum to immediately to go see some sweet gums. Uh, oh, you know. please send yeah, me pictures, please. Oh, of course, of course I will. But, but I think about, you know, the, the, the infructescences that fall and their spikes and I photograph them many times, but you've just this evening by reading and, and sharing that passage have changed my relationship forever with, with oh. a sweet gum. Um, oh. I will, I love the, these trees dearly. Uh, they're some of my favorites, but, but what you've done is, is, is something really quite interesting. You've changed something. You've, you've given me a sense of a relationship I had no access to. And, and, and I, you know, the sycamore is a little bit harder to want to go see because there's right. such pain associated with that. But I feel like I also have to go and, and see some of our, our sycamore trees, which are actually not far from the sweet gums. But, but there's something, at least for me, and, and I, I know when we're done with all the pandemic business, um, I, I, I want to hear more of these stories uh, from you. And I want to be at the trees when you talk about a sweet gum. And I want to be there uh, when, we, when we stand under our, our wonderful old pecans. But, but the unearthing of these stories is powerful. I, I'm just sort of overwhelmed by, by these snippets. I mean, you've only shared small bits and, and the idea that there may be more and more scholarship that un, uncovers these uh, stories, I, I think uh, is, is, is moving and also, um, I'm not sure what the word is, but it, it, for me, it just seems so important to, to uncover the human relationship with nature as powerful. So, so I, I'm, I'm really, really um, excited or moved to, to go. Actually, I'll be there probably tomorrow, the next day uh, to go see a few sweet gums. I'm going to turn over to Pam. There are a few questions I think we can take in, in, the, in the next couple of minutes at most. I know you have to go and have a, a very busy schedule and then we'll bring this to a close. But Pam, would you uh, like to at least bring one or two questions to the fore? Yeah. Um... Early on, there was a question of um, when speaking of African American women being close to the land, how do you avoid conflating this with the stereotype of African American um, being closer to the earth, implying that it's because they are primitive? Such an important question. And it really is a problem, right? We can get tangled up in stereotypes that were created to catch us up in their nets. Um, I had a conversation very much like this in, in class recently, in a class I'm teaching on Native American women, where we talked about how there really is a problem that we confront in American culture. It's a similar problem as, as the questioner described. And that is, on the one hand, indigenous people, Native American people, are romanticized as, as um, floating through nature and as being, you know, especially essentially connected to the land. And this is done not for the purpose of 
protecting native lands or um, returning them to native peoples. It's done so that non-native peoples can um, enjoy that association and can um, enjoy sort of a fantasy of what they think it might mean to be indigenous. And yet, Native Americans, indigenous people actually do have a different relationship with the land, with their land. These are all their lands. And it is partly these relationships that Native people are continuing to fight for today. And so I think what we have to do is be willing to stake a claim, be willing to say that these relationships are real, be willing to, to do the work, to do the research, to, to pull those relationships out of the archives, to pull them out of oral histories, to find them in um, the visual record, to demonstrate that they are real. But I think that we also must really be cautious about romanticizing. And I hope that you heard in my presentation my attempt to not do that. Every time I gave a positive image, um, a beautiful description, I tried to actually balance that out with the reality of the ways in which nature um, could be damaging to enslaved people, presented dangers to enslaved people, could be used against enslaved people. So I think that we just have to approach this topic cautiously, but not be willing to give up what is ours because of stereotypes. Thank you. Um, could you mention again the works that you referenced, um, something about standing by a frozen lake surrounded by trees and- Oh, yes, yes. So this is the work of Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who was an African-American- Sorry. Harper, H-A-R-P-E-R, -E who was an African-American um, writer, political thinker, suffragist, uh, a poet, I mean, she, she did it all as, as women tended to do in those days, especially black women who, who were organizing for um, black rights. And she wrote several poems about enslaved mothers, you know, really focusing on uh, the case of Margaret Garner, which is the basis for Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved. Margaret Garner being an enslaved woman in Kentucky who um, ended up um, killing one of her children so that it wouldn't so that, so that the little girl wouldn't be taken back into slavery. Mm -hmm. And so um, Harper is describing Margaret Garner's escape across the frozen Ohio River. And she has this, this wonderful winter scene where she uses all the different elements mm -hmm. in nature to help to dramatize the story of this enslaved mother. It's, it's beautiful and, and of course, very sad. Mm -hmm. Um, another, could you repeat? <laughs> the um, two others who were featured other than Harriet Tubman, someone's interested in looking up these people. Um, to learn. Oh, the people that I spoke about? Yeah, yeah. Um, John Brown, mm -hmm. but, but not the John Brown people tend to think of. This is an African-American John Brown who was enslaved in Georgia. I talked about Harriet Jacobs. Okay. And... I talked about Antoine, who is not very well known at all. We, we just have little snippets, of tiny little bits of information about him. I mean, when I say tiny, I mean tiny snippets of information about him. And I uh, basically shared what those are. It's unsettling to know what they are because one of those is how much he was worth to um, his enslavers. Right. And I talked about Ashley. Um, we don't have a last name for Ashley, but she is the little girl who was separated from her mother in South Carolina through a sale. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm gonna, I know you have to, to run, so I'm going to, uh, as much as we could listen to you for much, much longer, I, I, I do know you have to go. I wanna thank you for what was a beautiful presentation, the subtlety, you just, the, the, the pairing of the pain and the beauty um, require all of us to think hard about the meaning of what you've shared with us. And I wanna thank you for doing that. And, I look very much forward to uh, more conversations with you, more plants, and for my continued uh, awakening, I think about some of the things that you've shared with me that I need to know much more about. So thank you, Taya. It, it's just been a distinct privilege to, to host you tonight. Thank you.
Thank you, Ned. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Mitchell. Thanks everybody who, who came tonight and sat here for an hour listening to me read about trees. <laughs>